God's people say together, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you noticed, but we switched up the order this morning. We started with our New Testament text. We don't usually, usually goes old to new. Today we're going new to old. But that is such a good lesson, that text the Sale family just read for us, before we turn to the prophet Isaiah. That first text is a reminder that we don't have to waste our energy on worry. The Lord will provide all we need. And we will need that kind of provision if we're going to live the call from our second text. This time, it's the Old Testament second. It's just seven verses of Isaiah 58. But before I read it, a quick review of what happened in the first 57 chapters (laughs) of Isaiah. It's a really long book. It's actually several prophecies to the Israelite people over a period of about 200 years. So even though we see it as just one book of the Bible, it's really a series. It has three parts, so we could think of it as the trilogy of Isaiah. In the first part, the prophet tells the Israelites that they will face the judgment of God if they don't shape up and follow right. Yep, it's a harsh word. Skip ahead to the second part. And the lives of God's people have been totally disrupted. Jerusalem, their home, has been conquered by an enemy army. The Israelites are now in exile. Their temple has been destroyed. Their way of life has been destroyed. Some people have had to stay and live with that rubble all around them, looking every day at the destroyed remains of their community. Others are living in exile under foreign rule, and they can't gather and worship the way they used to. And this disruption lasts for about 60 years. 60 years of chaos and longing for home, longing to go back to the way things were. For about 15 chapters, a prophet speaks to that broken up community. And part two gives them a picture of a time in the future when exile will be over and the Israelites will get to come back into Jerusalem and everything will be wonderful. But that isn't what happens. The community is eventually restored, sort of. The Israelites do return to Jerusalem, but it isn't a grand parade. It's a sort of trickling back with some people returning, some staying in exile. We pick up this morning with part three, where the prophecy is to the community that has come back. It is not all celebration and rejoicing, because even though God's people have come home, their community is still broken. You would think, after all that time and all that longing, they would be overjoyed to be together again you would think they would have nothing but gratitude for each other, that they would want to take care of each other. After all that time apart, you would think they would run back to church with nothing but happy hearts. Sadly, no. After 60 years, the fabric of their community has frayed and torn. God's people then, like God's people now, are divided. They're pointing fingers and calling names and blaming each other for the way things are. Some are even taking advantage of their neighbors for profit. Isaiah uses the image of putting a yoke on someone like you do to a work animal on a farm. Some people are still poor and hungry and homeless and isolated and their worship. Don't get Isaiah started on their worship. It is a hot mess. Some people have started worshiping like they're conquerors. Some are just going through the motions to try to look faithful. They're doing things like fasting, but their rituals are empty. It's a pretty bleak picture of community, especially for an installation day. But here's the thing about installations. 
They're a moment where a three-strand cord comes together. They're the intersection of the God who calls us, a pastor who is called, and the church who is called. When the three of us are going to make promises that are actually not at all about us, they're about God's community. So here's what God has to say to us this installation day, Trinity Church and Reverend Emily Catherine Beaver. Isaiah, I won't say your whole name the whole time, I promise. (laughs) Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 12. Is not this the fast I choose? You remember, God's people have been fasting, but it's been an empty ritual and their hearts aren't in it. Is not this the fast I choose instead? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your own house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You'll cry for help and the Lord will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you'll be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins will be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Emily, I wondered as we landed on this passage whether it would feel a little too literal in this moment. The images of breach and broken streets of people calling out to God for help. I thought of your home and a place we all love, Western North Carolina, and how breached dams and broken roads have put communities into crisis. How the idea of restoration can be both hopeful and motivating and just so daunting. But I also thought about how those breaches have shown us something about what community is supposed to do when things get broken as people, including your precious family, have looked around and seen the needs of their neighbors and have done absolutely everything in their power to preserve the community, to start cutting trees and clearing mud, literally sharing bread with the hungry and making sure there is water to satisfy the parched. I thought about what I have seen you do in these weeks calling this church to action, helping to coordinate efforts from Atlanta up the mountain, welcoming your own family into your home. Some folks here know this, but a few days after the storm knocked out all possibility of water and power to Black Mountain, both Emily's grandmothers and her parents all came to Atlanta to camp out in the manse. Your mom and dad kept going back and forth, taking supplies and helping in Black Mountain. Your mom's on the session at Black Mountain Prez this very day, right, Christy? But at some point, I think if we took a census, you had two parents, two grandmothers, one sister, two dogs, one cat, and a few reptiles at your house. (laughs) It's a beautiful picture, even if it was necessary for an awful reason. One morning, a few days into camp, Hurricane Helene, Emily came into the office and with a sigh, she announced that her grandmother Lois had run out of things to sew. 
She needed a project. She needed something to do. And she has the beautiful gift of sewing to offer. So she had been mending anything and everything you could find for her to work on. I believe you had run out of things that needed sewing at that point. And Mamma Lois had turned to working on t-shirts that maybe you would not have bothered to mend otherwise. We laughed about it. But what an image for today. In a world of frayed community, where hardship too often drives us apart instead of together, where we too often react with blame and opportunism instead of caring for each other, you all had gone looking for what was worn and torn and had set to the task of stitching it back together. I've seen you do this in our community too, Emily. I've seen you notice the kid who's on the outside of the circle and mend that breach. I've seen you at many of our many events, quick to notice when something needs doing, jumping in to move tables or stack chairs or scrounge up more paper plates from a closet somewhere. I've seen you sew up the whole of loneliness as you sit with members who can't get to the church building anymore. I've seen your joy as you lead us in communion, offering the bread of heaven to each of us who are hungry for grace. I've seen you teach our kids and some of our adults about the realities of poverty and disparity in our city, and I've seen you help them engage with our vulnerable neighbors to try to learn, to try to get closer to the kind of mutual love we're called to share. It's an awfully big task to lay at your feet on this installation day that you are called to repair the breach, to restore the streets for life, to sew up the places where the fabric has gotten worn or has a hole, or worse, people have ripped it apart. But here's some very important news about this passage. It is in the second person plural. Sorry, that's kind of nerdy. When Isaiah says, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in, Isaiah does not just say, you, Emily. Isaiah says, you all. All y'all is what we say <laughs> in our charming and redundant way around here. All y'all are called to look around and find the hurt places and the wrong places and the tender places. All y'all are called to repair them and restore them and sew them back together until we can see something of that beloved community the prophet told us about. I won't sugarcoat this, Emily. As you well know, ministry's hard. <laughs> Sometimes. This church that we love, Church Big C and this one right here, the one that has called you to come and serve, sometimes church will disappoint you. Sometimes people will be demanding when it is unreasonable or downright impossible. Sometimes they will be thoughtless in what they say. Sometimes people will be critical, sometimes even on purpose, because they're people. But I promise you, that they will also love you as you already love them. And I believe that when you, answering God's call on your precious life, help us to see the holes and the places in the fabric of our community that are so afraid that light is coming through, when you hold up for us the torn spots, we will join you and learn to sew. Because this is not just your call. It is our call to hear and answer together. Trinity Church, in a minute, you all are going to make some promises. An installation is a covenant. But I have some questions for you first. Do you believe that God has called Emily Beaver and given her all that she will need to be a repairer of the breach? Do you? We do. And who else is called to repair the breach? There we go. That answer out loud, please, is we are. Who else is called to repair the breach? We are. 
who else is called to restore the streets for God's beloved children to live in? We are. Yes, we are. We all are. We are blessed more than we can even know, much less name with our meager words. And along with the gifted Emily Beaver, we have the privilege of envisioning the beautiful quilt our community is meant to be and learning to sew together. For that privilege, thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>